Um, we uh, are going to get started in a few minutes. Uh, before we do that, a few uh, technical things on the side. So, um, in order to enhance audio quality for everyone, we will mute everybody. And um, that will, I think, greatly enhance the, the audio quality for, for everybody. Um, <clears throat> on a second note, um, when you join the webinar, you have a sort of a box on the side. Uh, and at the bottom of the box, there's a little chat uh, window. Um, if you have any technical concerns or problems, uh, please use the chat box. Um, my helping hand today is Christian Lemon uh, in Germany. And um, he will be monitoring the chat box. And if you have any sort of technical problems, please let him know at any point in time during this webinar. If you have questions regarding the content of the webinar, um, I would like to ask you to keep those questions till the end of each uh, part of the webinar. There will be two parts. The first is a presentation. Um, and the second one is then a, a live demo about the most important features of Lead IT, the software which um, hopefully uh, helps you increase productivity and, and I will go into detail once we start the presentation. For everyone participating in this webinar, uh, we will uh, grant you a two-month license for free. You can uh, try out Lead IT, test it to the bone and um, hopefully like it. Um, so uh, we will get in touch with you after the webinar. Uh, please give us a day or two, um, and then uh, you can you can we, we will instruct you how to get the license. Uh, for general support, uh, either questions regarding the software, technical questions during your trial period, or any other concerns, please write an email uh, at support at biosolvit.com. Um, somebody will be there to help you with your concerns. All right, so now uh, that was the intro stuff. Um, I think we can now delve right into the material. So again, welcome everybody to this first of the second uh, sort of season of the BioSolvent webinars, um, starting with how to enhance productivity uh, by engaging medicinal chemistry know-how early on in the CAD phase. And um, I think that um, the productivity issue is, is a pretty large one, substantially large, especially in the past uh, 10, 15 years in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I think we can all agree that uh, the industry is in quite a dire situation. Um, so the spending for R&D has almost doubled in the past decade. Um, with almost no effect on uh, the drugs that were approved by the FDA. There has been um, a, a slight increase in approved drugs in the past uh, two and three years, but on the average, um, the number of approved drugs has more or less stayed the same. So, and, and this uh, fact here has a severe consequence on marketed drugs as well. The pressure increases due to uh, waning patterns, and especially due to waning patterns, um, companies lose a lot of sales dollars. In the past four years, 2010 and 14, uh, about $100 billion uh, were lost in sales already and another $200 billion are at risk in the, in the upcoming years. So uh, the pressure increases on, on pharma companies and also uh, because uh, about 70%, 70 percent, 70 of all prescribed drugs nowadays in the U.S. are generics. So, of course, companies ask themselves and everybody else uh, who's interested in this, what could be the reason for uh, pipelines drawing out? Well, on the one hand, uh, the research and development in pharma is only about 70% effective. Uh, the picture shown here is Bernard Munoz, a former employee of Eli Lilly, uh, and he's now the founder of the Innofing Center for Research and Biomedical Innovation. Uh, he claims that um, the declining product revenues in large cap drug companies can only be replaced by about a quarter of new product revenues. So, you know, 
sales dollars are lost, but they will not be replaced by um, a new uh, revenue stream. Another problem is um, that uh, new molecular entity drugs that make it to market seem to lack the market size and revenue stream of poten uh, the potential of their predecessors. So in the 1990s, about 11 new drugs had reached these uh, sort of Hall of Fame of the top 100 drugs um, in terms of global sales. Um, and that number declined um, up until the mid-2000s, where only about two new approvals uh, broke into the top 100. So the question not only is how to enhance productivity, but also how to enhance the uh, innovation, how to get into uh, a new chemical spaces, um, and how to really uh, be innovative about this whole uh, subject. Before we want to address the productivity problem and look at ways how to enhance productivity, however, we must define what productivity actually is. And again, it was Bernard Munoz um, uh, that uh, came up with a uh, definition here. Productivity is the um, is proportional to the work in progress uh, that is all scientific and clinical research conducted simultaneously at a pharmaceutical institution. The likelihood of technical success, so how likely uh, a drug will be um, enter will be entering uh, the market, uh, times the value of this particular project divided by the cost and the cycle time. And it's very obvious in this equation that, and it's probably also the most obvious solution to look for, is to reduce the cost and or the cycle time. If we look at the drug discovery cycle, although this is not a cycle, it's more like a pipeline, um, the cost for bringing a new molecular entity to the market is quite substantial and it takes a long time namely about 13 to 14 years. And the capitalized cost um, for a new molecular entity to reach the market is about $2 billion. And um, the, uh, the hit to lead and lead optimization phase, that's basically the, the two uh, stages that we as a software company are addressing in this uh, context, um, also contribute with, with about a quarter of the cost uh, so about $500 million and about four years altogether for these two stages combined. So we could ask ourselves what effect would have a reduction in cycle time have on costs and there are different approaches. A very simple of course would be uh, to divide the overall cost by the number of months. So if we say we would uh, shave off four months of, this, of these two stages here which is not a lot. Uh, it's about 10%. Um, we could save about 50 million bucks. Um, there are other sources which claim that um, in the preclinical phase, if we save about 10%, uh, the cost saved will be about 1%, so about still about $20 million. So this is quite substantial and not very obvious if, if we look at it this way. Um, let me now uh, back off a little bit. Um, this is a picture of the Berlin Wall. Uh, the Berlin Wall was built in 1961. I'm from Berlin, that's why I'd like to bring up this picture. And the wall uh, effectively disrupted the interaction and communication between its citizens in the East and the West. And um, the reason why I bring up this picture is that we as a software company, when we visit customers, oftentimes we do see walls, um, or we observe walls, literally or figuratively. Uh, between different departments and, and most notably the medicinal chemist and the computational chemist. And uh, this disrupted communication of course has a dramatic effect on the creativity and it can be a substantial bottleneck in the whole drug discovery process. So um, oftentimes as you might very well know, uh, the medicinal chemists and the computational chemists have their own very own ideas about compounds um, and it is very hard for the computational chemists to uh, convince the medicinal chemists, you know, what compound to choose, what compound to synthesize, uh, and so on. So we were thinking, or you know, what what can we do about this? Um, and one source, of course, is to ask the medicinal chemist, and most not notably, a very well-known medicinal chemist is Krzysztof Pinsky, who said rational dialogue between medicinal chemists and computational chemists can be very productive. 
And if you notice this word be productive, that's sort of already, uh, I think, a big step uh, towards a solution. So uh, in, uh, in, in the mid-2000s, we came up with um, a project together with the Roche company, how to engage medicinal chemists and, um, and computational chemists um, in, in, in a more productive way. And interestingly enough, later on, we discovered a seminal paper by uh, Professor Hughes from the Kellogg School of Management. So obviously, business schools were also addressing uh, this issue of how to be more productive and how to um, get into uh, untapped innovation space. And uh, they were suggesting that um, one should develop an evolutionary technology uh, that uh, improves the speed and or accuracy of an existing process um, or activity in research and development. And the second was uh, to develop a large team-based interdisciplinary technology. And that's very interesting. So keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's a technology that improves the speed and uh, it's an interdisciplinary technology. And so again, if, if we incorporate the medicinal chemists into, in this interdisciplinary team um, between CompChems and MedChems, uh, uh, another um, very notable fact uh, happens or, or process happens, namely that the medicinal chemist takes ownership of the CompChems idea. And this is again something that Chris Lipinski is also uh, uh, um, suggesting um, to how to increase uh, you know, the, the communication. So there's also an often underlooked uh, fact um, of this, and, and uh, the, this whole process can take a benefit of the fact that medicinal chemists, uh, I'm going to move that, okay. Uh, medicinal chemists uh, have a very subjective selection process. This little pink uh, thing here is the amygdala, and uh, this, the amygdala is that part of the brain that's responsible for love and emotions and empathy. And this actually is the medicinal chemist's most powerful tools because medicinal chemists love good structures. They, uh, they select structures oftentimes by how much they like them. This whole process is very, very creative, uh, but it is also, on the other hand, very subjective. Um, so this is part of the reason why there are, uh, why the pumpkin sometimes have such a hard time convincing medicinal chemists um, uh, to synthesize a structure. So, and this paper that I cited down here actually uh, describes this consistency, or, or we should better say inconsistency, of the selection process by the medicinal chemists. So, taking all this together, or putting it all together, uh, we came up with a software that supports uh, this interdisciplinary team formation, accuracy, uh, and making making use of this very um, sort of subjective selection process by the medicinal chemist. And the first uh, most important point that we put into uh, a software was uh, the software should be interactive, meaning that um, speed should not be an issue. Um, you should get the results in an interactive and very fast way. Uh, think of it um, in terms of Google. Google would have never been so success successful if you had to wait for the results for several seconds and uh, most notably if the ranking wasn't very accurate. So if you do a Google search, what you're looking for is most of the time within the first five ranks. And this is a, this is a very important fact also in, in drug discovery if you, if you want to do this in an interactive way. The second finding was that we implemented that the software should be visually engaging. Um, it should be very easy to grasp the concept for the team um, so that you don't have to study columns and rows of numbers, but rather get um, a, a visual feedback by the software uh, <clears throat> that allows you to make decisions very, very quickly. And the third very important thing is that the software should be easy to learn. It should not be necessary to study a guide or a user guide um, uh, for two days in order to start using the software, but rather you should open the software on your computer and start to work right away. Okay, 
So with this being said, uh, let me now sort of uh, go over to um, the process that the software uh, supports here. So it is more or less a circular process um, where you start to improve a structure. And improving structure um, oftentimes is um, basically scaffold hopping, taking out a, a, a part of the molecule and replace it with something um, with something new such that you can, for example, evade a patent uh, or uh, get into a novel chemical uh, space. The second uh, thing is, uh, for example, you have a fragment binder in a pocket and you want to elaborate this fragment binder into the, into the active site. So <clears throat> successively you build up your way towards, for example, a pharmacophoric point on at the rim of the active site or in, in, in the depth of the active site. And the third is uh, to link or merge um, fragments that are in different subunits of the active site or uh, sub pockets of the active site um, to make them uh, one compound with improved binding um, uh, uh, properties. Okay, so these three all should be uh, should allow the team to, to work on very, very quickly. So when you when you do this, you want to see the results right away. And these results should be also very accurate in terms of uh, how well does this newly introduced fragment fit into these two peripherals here such that the overall binding uh, is not affected too much. Once this has been done, this improvement step, you could go further to the validation step which can be either dock the compound back into the active site, see how well it clusters, um, or how well it fits. Uh, it might have a different binding mode after the change. Uh, so that can be validated with um, the docking tool that is part of the software. Um, <clears throat> there's another software which you can look at, which is called Torsion Analyzer, which allows you to see if the new molecule has any invalid torsions, torsions that would affect your binding affinity. These are all uh, tools that you can use in this validation step. Uh, the last step then of this circular process is to understand the implication you have made here on your structure. So in meaning that um, how much better or worse does your new compound uh, bind in the active site? Is there any area in the molecule uh, which may cause a problem um, or uh, you know an area that actually has an improved binding um, property to you know to the to the protein all right so uh, let me go to the improvement step now and explain how we uh, support that uh, this uh, tool is uh, that supports this process is called ReadIT Recore and it allows you to google like uh, uh, rescaffold your molecule, meaning that um, you have a molecule, you define the cuts to the on the bonds uh, to towards the fragment you want to uh, take out, and uh, then you search a 3D fragment library um, <clears throat> for replacements that are single entity and rigid. That is very important, such that. Uh, these peripherals that you left um, as attachment points to the protein uh, don't move too much when these bonds are formed. So now, uh, in order to search really fast and interactively, uh, we cannot uh, do a, a regular sequential search in a fragment library. Moreover, we need a, a very um, sophisticated um, fragment library called an index that allows us or that allows the software to just pull out those solutions that fit this uh, these into these two peripherals or three peripherals or however many you may have uh, the best. And uh, in order to uh, generate this index, the software cuts the molecules according to uh, certain rules. These are very similar to the recap rules, and um, then uh, we look at just one fragment here. Uh, the software assesses uh, the so-called exit vectors. Um, this is basically the bonds that you have cut towards the uh, previously existing rest of the molecule. 
uh, exit vectors are assessed with in, in terms of their relationships towards each other. And all this information, the fragment together with the relationships of the exit vectors is stored in the index. And the, uh, the consequence of this is that um, the results delivery is not only very, very fast, but you will have um, a rank order list uh, deviating from very, very good fit to uh, increasingly worse fit. So the, when the results come in from your search, um, <coughs> the, uh, the quality of the results, uh, so to speak, um, is declining the further down the list you go. So what we do here is basically solving a geometric problem. This is not a sort of a, a chemical uh, assessment in, in the, right now. It is simply how well does the replacement fit into the void that you have uh, created here. The beauty of this interactive process is that the medicinal chemist and the computational chemist can sit together with a cup of coffee, ideally, uh, in front of the computer, and they can look at the results together and decide together which compounds to, for example, save, which compounds to further optimize, um, and which compounds then ultimately uh, to keep for a synthesis. But before that, <coughs> they want to, um, they probably want to prioritize this list a little further. Um, and that uh, tool that helps them do that, this is now the um, understanding step, the third step in that circle that I showed you previously, uh, is called MIDIT HIDE. HIDE is the, uh, the two first letters of hydrogen bonding and desolvation. Uh, this is um, the only two terms of this new development that we have that, uh, that is taken into account, that are taken into account for this uh, scoring step. So uh, picture a molecule here in the active site and the team of computational and medicinal chemists, for example, wants to assess now how well this molecule binds. And um, they can look at the molecule in the so-called high colors, which tell them which atoms are penalized according to the height score. So height calculates a score for each atom and according to whether the score is beneficial or not beneficial to the overall binding affinity, the, uh, the, the atom is colored in red for not beneficial and in green for beneficial. So for example, here you have a nitrogen atom that is supposed to form a hydrogen bond with a carbonyl backbone, uh, CO. And uh, the, both atoms actually are colored in red because they don't form a hydrogen bond of very good geometry. Um, so consequently, uh, this atom is colored in red because the penalty it has to pay uh, for this non-existing um, interaction is about 10 kilojoules per mole, which is one to two orders of magnitude in binding affinity. And that is the, the crucial difference of height towards other uh, scoring methods that it not only sums up the uh, favorable interactions, but it also penalizes those interactions that are not present. Um, on the other hand, we do have a oxygen atom here, which is um, also penalized, not quite as high as this, as you can see in the uh, in the color, it's only a slight red. So there is a hydrogen bond, but it's also of not perfect geometry, and that's why we still get a penalty, uh, because the desolvation energy uh, that this atom exhibits when you take it out of the bulk of the solvent and into the pocket is not overcompensated by the hydrogen bond energy it forms in the complex between the protein and the ligand. On the other hand, back here we have a methyl group which due to the hydrophobic effect sits quite comfortably in this hydrophobic pocket and um, this methyl group is colored in green, meaning it contributes favorably to the overall score. So this is what we mean by visual interaction we can um, grasp with one glance, basically, where there is a potential a way for improvement on the molecule. And this is now the medicinal chemist's task to uh, basically um, come up with ideas uh, how to um, introduce a, differently, uh, a different um, functional group uh, in, in this area. Okay, uh, Hyde 
like I mentioned, consists only of the hydrogen bonding and the dehydrations. That, that's all there is to high. Um, and because we are looking only at these two uh, um, uh, uh, terms here, uh, we need to um, optimize the complex before we score it. That's very crucial because um, Hyde is very picky on the geometries in the complex. Um, so as you saw, even though there was a hydrogen bond present in this complex that I previously showed you, um, the uh, uh, the um, uh, the hydrogen bond did not overcompensate the loss in desolation. So optimizing the complex is a very crucial element of the scoring. So the optimization happens in two phases. The one, the first one is to get the hydrogen bond network in the protein and with the ligand uh, right. Uh, so all the torsions uh, of the um, hydroxyl amino acids uh, have to be right, the protonation states, of, for example, histidine and so forth. Uh, and then uh, a very cool force field optimizes the complex uh, with respect, in particular, to the hydrogen bond geometries. And then Hyde uh, calculates the change in free energy of binding for each atom I as the sum of the uh, free energy of dehydration for each atom I, um, a change in free energy, um, and the change in free energy for the hydrogen bonds for each atom I. And uh, uh, this concept is very, very simple, but it's very, very effective. In fact, um, we uh, found that um, in a, a binding affinity prediction, uh, if we even look at only the hydrophobic part, uh, high ranks uh, within existing scoring functions very, very well. This was on a very challenging uh, data set, namely the PDD bind, and it's actually something that uh, we never uh, recommend to do because the data of the PDD bind is very inconsistent because it comes from different sources and the error uh, bars are very, very high, but still everybody does that and uh, we, we wanted to see how well high uh, compares to the rest of the uh, existing scoring functions. Um, so the hydrophobic part of high or height with the hydrophobic part only has one descriptor, namely the hydrophobic one, uh, and the advantage over everything else here in the table is that it is not calibrated on any protein ligand data. It is based on this very simple complex uh, concept um, of the hydrogen bond energy and the dehydration. And that's, that's the big advantage that basically you can use it for any protein ligand or even protein-protein complex, um, whereas everything else um, is basically uh, uh, calibrated on protein ligand complexes, meaning that there's a, a strong bias towards these that have been used for the calibration. Uh, the X score, which is on the top of the list here, actually was calibrated on this very data set uh, so it's, it's, it's actually an unfair comparison and it's not very surprising that it scores the best on, uh, in this list, which, which also underlines the fact that calibration is, is not a very uh, good idea in, in some cases. All right. Uh, so again, coming back to the visual feedback, we, we do have here a, uh, um, uh, protein ligand complex. Um, the ligand is colored in, in high color. Um, so red atoms mean a, a unfavorable uh, contribution to the score. Green means favorable contribution and white is no contribution. Uh, there are two particular interactions or three uh, that I, sh I want to highlight here. One is this uh, oxygen of the ligand that is facing a, a carbonyl oxygen of the protein. And it uh, actually uh, is responsible for uh, a, uh, a penalty of almost 11 kilojoules because both atoms need to be uh, desolvated, but both atoms do not exhibit a hydrogen bond. Then uh, we have the hydrophobic effect here for this aromatic carbon, which contributes with minus 7 kilojoules to the overall score. So this is uh, the driving force behind binding, actually. And um, then we have this nitrogen atom here, which in this case also um, has a penalty for being desolvated, but this penalty uh, is overcompensated by the uh, hydrogen bond that 
is exhibited between the um, nitrogen of the protein here and the oxygen. So the total uh, energy of this interaction is small but noticeable. All right, <clears throat> so um, this is sort of the, the theory behind height, uh, the scoring function, and height can be used in, in many, many ways in drug discovery and lead optimization. For example, to find activity clips. Um, you have here two molecules and they only differ by uh, the reduction in this functional group here. Uh, compound 7 is more active than compound 8 uh, and this is exactly what we see uh, in Hyde as well. So um, compound 8 is this here uh, and the, um, <coughs> the experiment is not quite as expressed as the Hyde uh, difference, but uh, the, it's it's the trend that we are after. We are not really after the, the quantitative assessment, but height points us into the right direction. Another one is activity trends. Um, this is a series of compounds for thrombin. They are all very, very similar, and as you can see, there is a very good agreement between the experimentally the, uh, experimental uh, binding affinity and the height calculated binding affinity. Um, and again, all this data comes from one source, from one lab, under the same conditions. So that's a very, very important uh, effect if you want to do something like this. And uh, then we have also, uh, I mentioned this briefly before, protein-protein interactions. Um, uh, so here is the uh, experiment uh, where there was uh, an alanine scan has been done, uh, which brought, uh, which elucidated that um, on the interface, um, phenylalanine and isoleucine are the um, amino acids responsible for binding. Uh, and we calculated uh, this protein interface um, with Hive, and in fact we do find the same thing, that uh, these two are the most important amino acids for binding. Likewise, uh, these two here, not quite as much, and that's exactly the finding that we have uh, from the experiment as well. So these are just three potential application scenarios. Uh, there is more, of course, you can use Hyde and Lead IT uh, for virtual screening, uh, for docking. Uh, FlexX is a module that I haven't talked about today that is available in Lead IT. Lead optimization, uh, I mentioned that, core replacement, fragment linking, merging, and growing, activity trends, compound prioritization. Uh, and also uh, very important is crystal structure elucidation. I will tell you where there is a potential problem uh, in your crystal structure, and um, uh, when you when you have a crystal structure and you you apply height to it, uh, there will be red areas where there is a potential problem, any water is missing, uh, close contacts, and and so forth. Uh, elucidation of drug resistance and so forth. Um, these are all uh, very uh, well established. Um, application scenarios of height. So with this being said, I hope that, um, and again this is a picture of the Berlin Wall in 89, we hope to be able to sort of at least lower the walls between medicinal chemists and computational chemists in particular, but also other departments, and if not uh, abolish any walls, um, because we think that this is a very uh, crucial part of the drug discovery process that there is a very vivid interaction between these two, um, and uh, you know, Chris Lipinski uh, uh, is um, has been cited many, many times with a similar uh, finding, basically. Um, so this is this is what we hope to be able to achieve uh, with our uh, uh, software. Uh, what's in for you as uh, a potential user of the software? Well, again, uh, the software allows you to be to form a team because of its interactivity. So within a few hours you can derive uh, many, many different uh, variations of a parent compound until you have found uh, a few that uh, you can either uh, synthesize a uh, focus library around or you can, uh, you can synthesize and you know, detect the uh, binding uh, affinity for this um, and then hopefully um, get into a, a very good lead class um, uh, to, for further optimization. Find those compounds that matter most. Um, so uh, a lot of 
uh, energy and, and resources are wasted for synthesizing compounds that don't exhibit uh, the desired binding properties. And so hopefully Hyde, um, uh, and we are convinced that Hyde will, will help you uh, find those compounds uh, that, that exhibit the uh, desired binding properties. Uh, the visual feedback is very important um, and then uh, decide more quickly and with more confidence which compounds to synthesize. So this uh, concludes the presentation part and uh, let me now come to the demo. But before I do, uh, if anybody has a question, um, please type it in the chat box real quick. And um, I'm sure, however, that um, many questions will be alleviated also by the, by the live demo of the software. Okay, so um, either there are no questions, which is either a good or a bad sign, uh, but um, in order for the sake of uh, saving time, um, I will go ahead and start the demo. Um, <clears throat> but you can maybe for this time around, uh, again, keep your questions to the end of the demo and then uh, we can discuss anything uh, that, that you might uh, want to know further. So you see here, uh, hopefully, uh, the uh, Lead IT graphical user interface. As you can see, and as I, as I said in the presentation, it's very, very simple. You can start right away. Um, um, and uh, so here are the three buttons that are responsible for handling the Lead IT project files. Uh, this is basically the three most important uh, modules that you will be dealing with, namely uh, protein preparation, docking, Recore, meaning taking out an unwanted core and introducing a new one, and prioritizing your compounds. This is for measuring angles and, and bond lengths and stuff and bringing into the focus and, and so forth. Uh, but these are the most important ones here. So I will start by uh, <coughs> loading a protein ligand complex from the PDB. Uh, you can do that when you click onto this protein preparation button here. You choose PDB server and you type the PDB code in there. And I will choose uh, um, the Vitra here, the PDE5 uh, complex, as you probably all are very aware of. Uh, the protein ligand complex is brought into the window here. This is the 3D window. Uh, you see the ligand inside the protein. And uh, now I go to the next step, which is choosing a chain. The chain is automatically chosen because um, because um, because we there's only one chain present. <coughs> In case there are any important metal ions, uh, you can select them here because they ought to be part of the protein. In this case, we don't need them, um, so I will I will leave them out. The next step is to define your binding site, and the binding site. Uh, has been selected automatically again because there's only one ligand present in this complex. If there's two, you have to choose the one by clicking on it. Um, and uh, if there's no ligand present, you can still select the binding site by choosing a sphere uh, or by spe specs in the input file or by loading uh, a, a, a ligand file from, uh, from external sources. So in this case, um, we uh, have uh, the ligand presence so everything is good. We go to the next step um, and um, we can deal with the most important step here which is uh, the, the hydrogen bond torsions, chemical and ambiguities and so forth. There's basically three parts of the table uh, and um, I just see there came a question here. We will read the questions aloud in the end so that everybody uh, can um, can learn from them um, and, and, and we'll deal with the questions later then. Okay, so here's the table with all the residues of the active site, um, the assignments and so forth. All this has been done automatically, so you don't need to 
interfere. If you want to make waters part of the active site that have not been selected automatically, you can do that in the in the third step. Uh, sorry, in the second step. Um, and there's also other small molecules here uh, that you can deal with. Um, you can edit this, and this is uh, a good example for doing that because, as you can see here, uh, the structure is wrong. It's the wrong tautomer. Uh, there's a, a CO a double bond here. It's a carbonyl bond, uh, and it's not an OH, so I need to change the tautomer. I click on this little stylo here. Uh, the molecule changes color. Uh, and by right-clicking on this molecule, I'll get a, a very crude, very simple editor in which I can change the tautomer here uh, to this one. So now we have a, a CO double bond. There's an NH here, which is all good because, as you can see, on the protein there's these uh, two uh, uh, hydrogen bonding partners, which are now still uh, in the wrong assignment you see that once I leave the editor, this is uh, changed automatically so that now I indeed have my important double hydrogen bond for this particular ligand. This is the only change I need to do now uh, so I can go to the next step and um, until all the assignments are done. All right, so uh, I can now conclude this protein preparation step. You can go through this much, much quicker than, than I did because um, I explained so much, um, but usually this takes about two minutes, three minutes, and then you're done. Uh, so now you have your ligand here with the protein, um, and we can go now to the uh, core replacement part, the improvement step of that circle that you saw in the presentation. Whoops, the ligand's gone. Magic. Um, this is, uh, of course, on purpose because sometimes you would like to bring in your own ligand uh, and you can do this in this add step here. Um, you can choose if you want to bring it from an external file or if you want to use the reference that came co-crystallized with the PDB structure. In that case, we want to choose this one. So we choose that. Uh, I just slowly turn this here so that I don't uh, have too much load on my computer. All right, so uh, now we can go ahead and define the bonds that we want to cut from uh, towards a certain element. And I would like to cut out this ring system here. Uh, so what I do first is I define the first bond to cut by clicking on it. And clicking again changes the direction. If I click the third time, the bond, this cut would be removed, and uh, then I could choose uh, another one. I'll choose a third, uh, second and a third one here. So this uh, ring system is now being uh, excluded and everything else is left where it is. And you can see that by this gray shadow, shadowy uh, bond and, and atoms. Um, however, I would like to do two more things. Namely, I would like to include at least this hydrogen bond in the search as a pharmacophore. So I switch to the advanced options and I choose this uh, button here, uh, this, this tab, Sphere Constraints. This is uh, the most powerful feature of the whole software because it allows you to augment uh, spheres by uh, smart patterns. So, um, for example, here we have a, a list of predefined smart patterns. Uh, acceptors um, are uh, already pre-selected and this is the smart rule for for acceptors, so you don't need to come up with that yourself, but uh, you can uh, you can simply use the predefined ones. You place the sphere on the atom that you wish to uh, augment with the smart tool. You can also place the sphere uh, between two atoms or between three atoms um, or inside a ring. Uh, for now, I use this oxygen atom here. I decrease the size by simply turning my mouse wheel a little bit. Uh, and I then add this to my search criteria. And the third uh, thing I would like to do is include the protein as a shape. So I click this here. In case you do not have the receptor but you only work on the ligand, you can simply use the ligand shape uh, to do that. Um, just increase the size a little bit. 
like that. And now I can click record and um, within a few seconds I get my suggestions for replacement and as you see on the first rank there's my original ring system which is very comforting that this is being found on the first ranks. I am uh, searching the Cambridge Structural Database, which is uh, a database of uh, high quality crystal structures of small molecules. Uh, this is the ideal index to search because um, these fragments, uh, the confirmations of these fragments are being derived from uh, experimental uh, um, environment, from the experimental environment. So they have um, seen solvent um, solvent effects and crystal packing effects and so forth. And there's a, a fundamental difference using these kinds of fragments versus fragments that have been calculated and minimized in the gas phase because the torsional energy between a gas phase torsion and a torsion in the solute is, is dramatically different and this is a uh, this difference could mess up your binding affinity, your, your bioactive conformation of the resulting compound. Um, so to get the conformation right uh, is a very, very crucial step in, in this um, particular experiment here. And this is uh, one big, big strength of ReCore over other tools that do a similar thing. So we can now go through the results here and uh, look at them. There are various different um, uh, solutions. Uh, one nice thing is that we, we do have um, a post view with the software here. Um, so you see the protein ligand complex in uh, 2D, which is very helpful, especially for the medicinal chemist, going back again to the visual feedback. Uh, and so you can basically now browse through your solutions here. and, and uh, Look at them, and I believe on rank eight, oh, rank six, we do have uh, the scaffold of Viagra, so the competitor compound. So this is also in the very high ranks, and it's very comforting that we do find this this compound here uh, so high in the list. So you can see that the results are meaningful, they are accurate, and they come in within a few seconds. So I could now go ahead and um, and score. Uh, this um, let me score uh, this this compound here that we just looked at. Um, in order to score it, you select it by uh, uh, choosing it. You right click with your mouse. Um, you say use selected composite for hide assessment, and when you do that, this compound is brought over to the hide module, um, and uh, it um, it is scored now. So now we we'll see the optimization step is happening. The uh, hydrogen bond network is resolved around the ligand, and after a few seconds, we get uh, the result of the of the score here. Um, there was a question that I can quickly answer. The CSD index does not come with the software. We do have a, a readily prepared CSD index um, on the CCDC website. That's the, the company that distributes the CSD. So you don't need to generate it yourself, but you need to uh, buy the CSD from the CCDC website. Uh, we, that's a product that we don't distribute. Um, it's, it's not our product. It belongs to the CCDC, uh, Cambridge Structural uh, Data Center, uh, or Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. So you see the compound is scored very, very well. Uh, there is uh, just one red atom here. This is a nitrogen that is not part of the hydrogen bond. When I click on the atom, I can relate to that atom in the table here. There's a height score that is positive, which is again the same thing as this red color. Uh, and I can now compare this to the original ligand, my Levitra, uh, by simply loading the uh, reference ligand file. So keep in mind we have minus 46 here, just as a rough number. Uh, it's in the green nanomolar area, which we know is, is actually true. Um, and now we score the original compound uh, to compare it with the binding that we had. Um, obviously, if you, if you did this in a prospective manner, uh, the process would look a little bit different. But um, I just want to show you here that uh, the software works very well with uh, you know, 
if, if you make a manipulation that is sort of sensitive and good. So you see that the binding affinity for this one is exactly the same. Um, it's also in the non-molar regime. And uh, we also have this, this nitrogen atom here on the, uh, in, in the, in the Mokalino ring here. So uh, let me now come to a different scenario. Um, I just want to uh, clear this away and go back to the uh, recore part. And uh, I would like to show you uh, how to grow a fragment into the active site. And in order to do that, I uh, go back to here. I have prepared a little bit. Uh, it's this here. So I cut off part of the molecule. I now have my ring system and I would like to grow this ring system into the depth of the pocket. And while this uh, particular experiment might not make a whole lot of sense uh, medicinal, in a medicinal chemistry way, I just wanted to show you the possibilities you have. For example, I would like to grow something that stacks against this panel ring here. Um, so what I do, I choose, uh, first off, I, I want to choose the bond that I use here. So I'm cutting away this hydrogen. And I'm choosing the mode in which I would like to use the software to the growing mode. This was the core extraction mode. This is the growing mode. And this is the linking and merging mode, which only becomes active if I have a second ligand present. So I click onto the growing. And you see that now I get uh, a lot of uh, arrows here, which are uh, pharmacophore points, target pharmacophore points that I can grow onto. Uh, the red arrows are hydrogen bond acceptors, which I don't really want to use at this point. I want to use this ring. So I change from hydrogen bond acceptor to phenyl center. And now we get much, much larger green rings that are perpendicular to the plane of the ring. And I can, I can choose this ring now. And you see that I get the target pharmacophore. And now I press record again, and maybe I want to do, uh, oh, actually, I, I want to leave away the shape for now because I want to show you something. So I, I, I will have no protein information, um, and uh, I'm simply going uh, towards this kind of ring. Sometimes you want to leave the protein information away because you know uh, that uh, this particular chain might be away, uh, or the protein might be very flexible. Um, and so, uh, in the first instance, it might be more useful to um, uh, strike here. My, my mouse wheel is a little sensitive, uh, so I'm waiting. All right. Um, <clears throat> so you see that um, all the results are actually stacking against this panel ring. Carsten? Yep. We have one question that is about um, the rank ordering of solutions in ReCore. Uh, since you mentioned that this is not based on the height score. Um, oh, okay. So what so, is what is the sort order in the table? Right. So I, I briefly mentioned that uh, when you saw uh, this one slide with the um, uh, the different colored uh, uh, central elements. Um, so the, the the rank ordering in ReCore is simply geometric. So uh, ReCore uh, extracts from the index fragments by how well they fit into the uh, two, three, or four given exit vector uh, exit vectors uh, that you have placed as bonds or pharmacophores. So it's a simply geometric problem that we solve. Um, and um, as, as you say, uh, the, um, the shape can be introduced as well. However, the shape is simply a, a filter, a filter after the search. Um, so the rank criterion, the, the um, initial rank criterion is the, basically just the exit vectors on the bonds, the, uh, the two or three or four or however many uh, you may have selected um, to cut out your core. All right, 
Uh, let me just conclude this. Um, so uh, you saw in black um, some uh, window, but fine. Here, here it is. Yes. Um, maybe now is the time to answer another question that came up, uh, and that is, yeah. if you have a list of ligands designed up in issue, I guess that means designed somewhere else, um, uh, or using a tool like LeadIT, how can we use Hide for those ligands? What is the main purpose you know, for um, up in issue ligands? Uh, what is the main purpose? Okay, I, I just pulled up the question here. If we have a list of, so the question is, if we have a list of leads designed up in issue using a tool like lead IT, um, how can we use hide for those ligands? So uh, the the important thing is that the ligands, of course, ought to be in the active site. Um, so if you have the up in issue calculation done inside the protein somehow, um, which is very cost, costly, but um, if, if we assume that that's the case, you simply uh, load your protein, like I showed you before, um, you bring in those ligands, one after the other, and then you can score them and make a list. If it is many ligands, let's say 100 or more, uh, you don't necessarily take uh, into account the benefits of the GUI, but you can uh, score them uh, through the command line interface. So you have uh, a multi file, a multi multi file of those ligands, uh, and you can still score them with high. You, you get a rank order uh, that you can export, for example, to Excel, sort according to the high ranking, and then, for example, look at the 10 deaths of these uh, 100 in, in the GUI. Uh, if they are not in the active site, uh, so if you only have the up initio uh, calculated ligands and no protein information, I'm afraid you will have to lose this up initio information because but somehow you need to bring those ligands into the active site, otherwise you cannot score them, obviously. So in that case, I would recommend to use uh, the FlexX docking or you can use any other docking tool you want um, and, uh, and then score those uh, uh, those docked uh, poses with high. The advantage of using FlexX in that case is that you have everything already in your uh, in your software. You don't need to import uh, all these uh, doc solutions from somewhere else. Okay, uh, I think that's to those two questions. Um, let me quickly wrap up the demo here. Um, I showed you in this last um, part of the demo that you can really choose your pharmacophore points in terms of hydrogen one acceptor, donor, phenyl stacking, uh, or other uh, phenyl interactions, and also um, uh, amino uh, uh, amide bonds. Um, and so this allows you to, to grow your ligand uh, into the depth of the pocket by utilizing these pharmacophoric informations, uh, and, uh, and so this is this is the list that you have here. Um, and basically, if if there was any ligand that is of interest, you could now export this, uh, or you can uh, work on this again uh, further in Recore, or you can dock it back into the active site. So all three modules you can use. Um, in order to improve your results. Um, so, for example, if this was a molecule here that is of interest, you would again select it and then uh, use it as a, as a height assessment or you can dock it back into the active site. And from there, you could then again go into Recore, uh, make further uh, uh, changes and so forth until you are happy with the result um, that, that, that you have. So it's a really circular process and uh, within one afternoon, you will get um, at least a few ligands that you can that you can synthesize. Um, that pretty much wraps up the demo part. Uh, and now let's see if we have more questions. So there's one more 
Uh, does DDIT allow stereoscoping visualization? Um, I believe it does, does it? Um, it Christian, what's the latest status on that display? Uh, yes, please. it does. Yeah, it does. So stereo, uh, I think you need specific hardware for that, but um, you have a stereo view, and so you see that the, the view is different now. If you have a, a, a 3D stereo graphics card, that process will be supported. Uh, let's see, was there another one? Uh, can we use the high module inside a batch script? Yes, you can. And get the binding free energy in the same way as in the nice GUI. Um, yes, you can, and you can even do it for many ligands. Uh, like I said, you, um, it's a very simple uh, command line uh, command, uh, command line command. <laughs> So you say uh, hide uh, minus minus protein minus minus ligand file, and then uh, the the uh, uh, if, if you want to have your results in Excel or CSV or, or whatever, uh, I do have many compounds already docked to a protein, and I would use the GUI interface. It will be time consuming for me. That's right. So you would have to use the command line interface in order to do that. Um, and yeah prefer machines to do that work, I agree, uh, we should leave that up to the machines. Um, yes, and there was another comment, I guess an intermediate step is to dock the ligands and score them, yes, that's true. So once you did your recore analysis, um, like I showed in the introduction of the presentation, the validation step could be a docking step where you dock the ligands back into the active site, see how well they cluster. And if you have a nice clustering, you can be relatively sure that the solution you came up with makes sense, and then you can go ahead and score these uh, in order to find the best one of these. I think that's it in terms of questions. Let me see. Yeah, I think that was all. Yeah. Are there any more questions from the audience? I think we can close the official part and take more questions yeah. afterwards, right? Yeah. So uh, thanks to everyone for taking your time to uh, watch this webinar. Uh, keep in mind the next webinar is uh, on Thursday, uh, two hours earlier. Uh, so it's, um, uh, what is it, then uh, 5 o'clock in Europe. Uh, 8 o'clock Pacific time, 11 o'clock Eastern time, um, and uh, that's the next in our series. Thanks again for your participation, and we hope this was useful. And again, we will contact you guys uh, how to get your two-month free license. <laughs>